Jeff, lovely to meet you, albeit virtually. Um, I have seen you perform, uh, but it's a real thrill because I love talking to comedians. And um, thank you. But what's interesting with you? When I was looking at your illustrious CV, right, Jeff, you <laughs> you've start you did you start did you want to be an actor really first or you um, know? no? I always I always wanted to be a stand up comic, but then I went to stage school, and um, but stage school, but the the acting came along. I got, I got a, a, a nice part in a film. Uh, called Bugsy Malone, yeah. and uh, it just went from there. And then when I was out of work as an actor, I became a comic. <laughs> and uh, I've been a comic for many, many years. Um, and now, uh, the, what, the one good thing that's come from lockdown is uh, I'm, I'm actually getting back into the acting in, in a way. Which is what I want to bring up first. You've got this fabulous new film, and this is what really I, I admire you for this, Jeff, because as you rightly said, you know you are king of cruise ships, and um, yeah. you've been around the world plying your trade. And then when yeah. you've been stuck here, you've gone back into acting, got this film, and not only that, it's got nominated for awards and all this sort of stuff. Tell us about oh. it, and how did it come around for you? Well, uh, the show it was a stage show in Edinburgh called Touching the Blue. Uh, about a, a washed-up snooker player. And um, the, the guy that uh, put on the show, Joe Wenborn, asked me in 2008 if I would do it. I said, what, Edinburgh? No, nah. I said, it, it, uh, August is my best month. Yeah. I said, you know, on the ships, I can do six ships. And uh, no, nah. I said, I'm not going to Edinburgh. It ends up, you end up costing you money. Yeah. Uh, you know, most of the comics lose 15, 20 grand at least. And uh, I had a you know young son and uh, my wife, and I just thought, no, I can't afford to do that. So um, that was all forgotten about, and uh, they did it. They did it in Edinburgh, and they did, it did very well. Then uh, a few weeks ago in uh, June, Joe Wenborn, who um, is the producer, he's a he's a good mate. He phoned me up and he said, "What are you doing?" I said, well, "What do you think?" <laughs> so <laughs> he said, uh, "How do you fancy uh, doing a film?" So I said, "What film?" He said, "Touching the Blue." That state. I said, yeah, I said, I wouldn't mind. He, he said, I'll send you the script. I mean, like I would have been worried about it. So he sends me the script and it was just, I mean, most of it is me, uh, apart from a few interviews with famous snooker players. Yeah. And uh, I thought, I said to Joe, I said, I don't know if I'm the right man for this. I said, because it's a lot to learn. I mean, he said, yeah, we've got four days to do it. I said, I, I honestly don't know if I, I mean, maybe if you can do autocure. He said, no, you can't do that when you do acting. I said, right. I said, well, if you think I can do it, I'll do it. I said, but I am stepping out of my comfort zone. <laughs> so, so anyway, he said, well, we're going to uh, rehearse over Zoom. Oh, said, this God. is why I'm so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we rehearsed over Zoom twice a week for a month and uh, in my lounge. And I was walking around. I had the phone up on the curtains and walking around doing all this ranting and raving like you, you've seen in the film. And... Uh, I thought, yeah, it'll, it'll be all right. It's, it'll just be a short film and that'll be it. So then he got this film company, Visualize Films, uh, involved. And uh, uh, John and, um, and Dave at Visualize Films came on board and we, we filmed it for a week in a, a very small factory unit in Hainal, Gosh. Essex. And we had to make that unit into a dressing room at the Crucible Theatre. Which clever, is where... But clever though, Jeff, isn't it? You know what I mean? And actually, what I think, not only will it resonate with people who love that sport, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. the background to it, because I mean, in our era, I remember, um, I think we all did, um, uh, who was the guy with the glasses, the big sports guy, uh, snooker guy? Oh. Dennis, Dennis Taylor. Yeah, and do you remember when he won? It was, I mean, millions of people yeah. watched that, you know? Yeah, and yeah, I think that's course. when people really got into that game, didn't yeah. they? You know what I mean? And, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Did has it now has it now whetted your appetite to do more acting oh, again? Or, you know? It, I, it's, I've got a new agent. I've, um, <laughs> which is, is I mean, it's, at the moment, that's like having another deck chair on the Titanic, you know? <laughs> um, I've, uh, I, I've joined all the websites that do the casting. And I've got a great show reel now because I've got about a three minute show reel from um, from Touching the Blue, yeah. and I'm sending it out to everyone. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot of interest. I mean, I don't know if, if anything will happen, but it's proved to me that I can actually I can give the acting a go. Yeah. And it, it, I never yeah. ever thought that I would be a, a, a serious actor. And uh, the more we got into uh, this filming, by the second day, it was um, I was just loving it. You know, yeah. it was just great. Yeah, yeah. I was good. But you see. Um, 
you kind of come a full circle because you got a part when you were very young in a in well it was a phenomenal musical film really wasn't it Bugsy Malone um, absolutely you know again I remember as a kid being very envious of you people in it because you know when yeah. you think that's what I want I want to do how do you get into that you know and there was all sorts of bits about it on things like News Round and Blue Peter and you know what I mean it was um, yeah. probably the first time I saw any cross branding of a, a product if you like you know well how yeah. did you get that part then Jeff and what who were describe who was in it and what it was like for you um well it was Jodie Foster Scott Bio John Cassisi wow. um Mark Curry loads of Mark Curry who you will know Catherine yeah. Aponovich was in it you know oh yeah you know yeah Catherine? she was um yeah. actually she was a host on a tv show years ago a uh, local thing called Calendar Kids uh that yeah, we yeah. had on York, uh, Yorkshire tv and I think she also popped up on um Junior Showtime <laughs> <laughs> yes, she did. Well, the, the the woman who who ran the dancers was Jean Pierce uh, from Leeds, who you know. I'm oh, sure. Billy Pierce's mum. Yeah, Billy yeah, Pierce's mum. Yeah. Well, Jean, Jean did all the um, uh, weren't casting, but she was she was the one that was in. Uh, most of the dancers were from her school. Wow, you see, it's in a small. Yeah. It's a big world show business, isn't it? But it's a small yeah. world as well, Jeff. You know. So oh, absolutely. What were what were your memories of the movie? Did you you know when you were making it, Jeff? Did you realise? Um, I think it's fair to say it's a cult film now. You know, it's one of those that you know at the time people say, yeah, it's great, it's full of kids, it goes. But then it sort of had a second life and a third life, didn't it? And kept absolutely. coming back on telly. You know. Well, it's been a calling card for me for many years, even though it was a small part. I mean. Lou is not the biggest of parts, but oh, it was great fun. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, I was very, very lucky. I, I, when I went to uh, stage school, Barbara Speaks, um, I was doing lots of auditions and uh, I, I did some uh, commercials. And there was a guy who had a, a commercial company called the Alan Parker Film Company. Wow. And we did, I did about probably four or five commercials for him in two, within a year of joining the school. So, anyway, so I was sitting in, uh, in the class one day, we used to get suddenly get um, uh, Barbara Speak would, would come in, or, or June Collins, who was uh, uh, the agent, who Phil Collins' mum, by the way. God. Yeah, <laughs> so, fabulous stuff, uh, though, isn't it? Yeah, so so they would come in and they would say, right, we've got an audition, Jeff, Keith, Brian, or whatever, you know, we need you guys, come on. So uh, uh, we went down, and Barbara Speak said to me, "It's for a film, a gangster film." How's your American accent? I said, I'm sure it'd be fine. <laughs> so she said, well, um, get in there and uh, see what you can do. So we're all, we're all lined up. It was like an identity parade, you know. Alan Parker comes in and he walks along and he's like, yeah. And he says to me, how are you, Jeff? So I went, yeah, all right, Alan, are you all right? And he, he said, uh, yeah, he said, stay behind. He said, I might, uh, I, I might want you to read for something, but stay behind, just stay behind over there. So I stayed and I read for Fat Sam. Because oh, yeah. I, I was quite big, big at the time, as you've seen in the film. And, um, well, I didn't get Fat Sam, but I got Louie. And I auditioned probably about three or four times. We did recalls. And then when I got the message, um, they said, you've got the, um, the film, six weeks uh, filming at Pinewood. And uh, there'd be a, a, a juicer there and you'll have a school there and everything. So that was it. And it was just... Honestly, it was like the best adventure camp. I can imagine, summer. yeah. Ever. And the, the, and the thing also, as you rightly say, is you know you don't realise it, but they, they, you're attached to big names because you've got Alan Park, you've got all these great people. I mean, Jodie Foster was like the biggest child star of that yeah. era, wasn't she? For our era, Absolutely. you know. Yeah. Um, and I think then she was superseded by Brooke Shields, I seem to remember. Yes. And every generation has one, don't they? You know, somebody that comes along. Yeah. What I loved about reading your notes, you know, as well, Jeff, was I love that story about you, your first professional gig as a stand-up. And um, your dad goes outside. <laughs> oh, he was so nervous, me. Poor old dad. <laughs> he, he, we lost him a while ago. He, um, we, I did this, I got this gig in the Manor Club in Wimbledon, uh, South Wimbledon, I think it was. And I, I said to him, oh, I'm going to go on the train. And he said, no, he said, I'll take you. So I said, all right. And my dad was a milkman. He was a very humble man, you know. Yeah. He, 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 not, he didn't want any fuss. He was quite shy, He'd stay out of the way, you know. And uh, but he was so proud. Anyway, he, um, he said, I'll come with you. And he, he, anyway, in those days, you had to do two 20-minute spots. Ooh. Two, not one, two. So, um, so we get there. 
And uh, the guy said, all oh, right, okay. And he didn't know it was my first gig, the, the, the guy who booked me. <laughs> he said, you're on at uh, half past eight, and then you're on again at 10. Okay. So anyway, I said to my dad, all right. He said, yeah, I'll just go out here. Anyway, um, I went on, stormed it. I absolutely stormed it. I loved it. Couldn't do a thing wrong. And I come off, and my dad sort of, he, he, he came in uh, just as I came off. And uh, I said to him, what do you think? He said, how did it go? <laughs> So I went, what do you mean, how did it go? He said, couldn't watch. He said, I couldn't watch. He said, I stood outside. He said, but I kept hearing laughs and I thought, oh, he's doing all right, he's doing all right. He said, but I couldn't watch. So, yeah, and I understand that. I'd do the same if it was my son now, I think. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I wonder about that, though, Jeff. You know, because you went down so well the first time. If it hadn't have gone well, do you think you'd have gone back or... You know what I mean? Because it's, yeah. it's like a sliding door thing, isn't it? You can't believe oh, your look on the one hand, but yeah. on the other, you're thinking, thank goodness they did laugh. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely would have gone back. I mean, before then, I'd done loads of um, charity shows. Uh, there was a lady called Pam Rhodes. I don't know if you know Pam. She used to do the religious programs. That's on right, yeah. Lovely lady. Pam Rhodes, yeah. uh, and lovely lady. And she, she ran a, um, a charity group called Waffle, which was d- wandering old folks free live entertainment and she would have a pool of artists and she would uh, send out a newsletter each month with a load of dates you know all these different uh, care homes yeah. and old uh, oap clubs and what have you and if you wanted to do any of them you just tick them off and told her oh. so i was doing like three, two or three of them a week just getting the experience yeah you know? yeah it's fantastic i was going to say it's important what, what i always think about comedians um and my father was a comedian and i always i, be, yeah. I remember being very young uh, and watching him on stage and um uh, i found him so brave to go you know to just walk out there really with only things in your head you know there's no auto cues yeah. or prompter boards or anything yeah. and to try and make people laugh you think how, how dare you do that you know it's like i always yeah. i feel so worried for anybody doing it now when when you after you'd done that and you'd you know you'd moved up a bit what would you say your next big break was for you because you got summer season at you're only 20 weren't you i think when you got your first summer season or oh, even before that i, I did um uh, I went off and worked on a holiday camp illegally at 15 uh, <laughs> in Hailing Island uh, because the school said, look, they, they asked us if um, we'd got any comedians. And uh, she said, you can go, go and, go and do it. So I went and did um, uh, the, the, the holiday camp, uh, Coronation Holiday Camp in Hailing Island. That was a great experience. <laughs> but then I got asked by Esther Ransom, um, or I got approached by an agent who said that uh, Esther Ransom was looking for a comic for a series called The Big Time. Oh, yeah. And there's a big audition at Clacton, Butlins. Yeah. So I said, great. Well, the people at Warner's wouldn't let me off to do the audition. So I said, bye bye, I'm off. And I left. And uh, I went and did the audition at Clacton. I didn't get the job. The guy who got the job was probably someone that you know, Tony Pierce. Oh, yeah. And yeah, and Tony got the job quite well deservedly. So he was a great comic. And uh, so it was back to normal. I was just doing, you know, all the bits and pieces. Um, a few commercials, a bit of acting, um, and I was doing uh, loads of, of gigs. Uh, pantomime, I did my first panto when I was 15 at uh, the White Rock Pavilion, Hastings. And who were you with, and who, who was with you in that panto? It was for a guy called Bunny Barron. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, it, the, the guy that played um, the dame, I was PC me in uh, Aladdin, and the guy that played the dame was a famous old uh well drag artist called ted gatty oh yeah and ted ted gatty is well known for giving danny larue his name he yeah. he, he had a um, a show and danny was was danny carroll and uh he said we've got to give you a new name he said yeah. when you're in drag you look like uh, a long street he said why don't we call you danny larue yeah. and so that he, he, he dined out on that story do you know what's interesting for you though is that, that is your grounding, isn't it though, Jeff? Do you know what I mean? To to yeah. get work with these sort of people, and and what I like about you as well is your um, uh, maybe it's the uh, arrogance of youth, really, but you think, well, I'll stuff that job. I'm going to go and give it a go on this yeah, big yeah. time. You know what I mean? Oh, and then absolutely. Because you, you don't know, do you? You don't know how it's going to work. And also in those days, television exposure was real exposure then, because um, yeah. 
I remember like watching New Faces and Opportunity Knocks and we didn't know these things were rigged and set up and all that sort of stuff. But when you look at it then, you think, how do you get on that? How do, you know, how would you yeah. go about that? And I always found this about Saturday morning kids TV. Now I'm older and you watch back these little footages and they say, I'm from Hounslow or I'm from this. You think, not too far from TV centre then. <laughs> you yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. work that out a bit, you know what I mean? You think, yeah. hmm, nobody from Yorkshire, I see. <laughs> But, yeah. So when you did that then, and, and after you'd done your panto and everything, where were you trying to go next and how did it evolve for you next then, Jeff? Well, I wanted, I wanted to be, ideally, uh, a young Jimmy Tarbuck. That was what I wanted to be. And um, so I was doing all the clubs and um, uh, pantos. Uh, my first summer season, I, I think I did, I did a summer season in um, uh, Folkestone. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, yeah, Folkestone. Uh, I did a summer season in Jersey. But oh, and, and when I was about 18, uh, 17, I did um, a summer season in Torquay for Billy and Trevor George, who were wonderful people. Oh, yeah. And the following year, I did it with uh, one for them in Colwyn Bay yes. with Ivor Emmanuel. Oh, yeah. It was a big star, yeah. though, wasn't it? Big, big, big star. star. It was in yeah. Zulu uh, yeah. film. So yeah. while I was there, um, I got asked to uh, do a... a a, a talent show at the time for London Weekend, which was brilliant, called Search for a Star. Yes. Uh, hosted by Steve Jones. Who was and a, a fabulous did, host. I always thought you had, uh, he was vastly underrated because he made it look easy, didn't he, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah he was great. So I did I did that, and now this is a quite a, a weird story. We had two days to, to do the show. So the first day, we did it in front of a packed out audience, and it was like a dress run. You know, and I went on and I had a great time. The big laughs all the way through and I thought, I've got this. I've got this. This is great. <laughs> but the next day, Steve Jones was doing um, uh, his show at LBC, right? So um, they said, we have to record the show at 4.45 in uh, London Weekend. Okay. The audience, there won't be much of an audience, probably be about a third of the audience. Not good for comedy. No. Not good for comedy. No. So I went on, did okay, didn't do anywhere like I did the night before. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I didn't get anywhere. I came about fourth. But it got me into warm-ups. Yes. Um, which uh, there was a guy called David Bell, I'm sure you know. Yeah. Or you knew. And uh, David Bell was wonderful. And uh, he, he book, started booking me for doing loads of warm-ups. And that was the way to learn yeah. how to... Uh, perform in a television studio. I think a warm-up man is vastly underrated, you know, because, um, you know, you, you it's a bit like anything, isn't it? You go into a theatre, a TV studio, it's a bit cold, bit wet, bit warm, whatever, and the audience, even though they've gotten free, are never grateful. So <laughs> they need yeah. to be coaxed into the game, you know? Oh. And um, yeah. I, I admire warm-up men because television is a long time to film things, and then the warm-up yeah. man has to think straight on his feet, jump in when it gets boring, and try yeah. and keep the audience occupied, which is not easy, is it? What what shows did you do at that time then, Jeff? Which um, did you... I did uh, uh, Search for a Star, I did the warm-ups for that. Yeah. I did um, lots of uh, Play Your Cards Right, I oh, did yes. the warm-ups for that. Um, loads of sitcoms, I did the uh, Late Late Breakfast Show uh, oh, yeah. with Noel, uh, Time of Your Life, uh, with Noel. This Is Your Life, I did yeah. that. I did loads of sitcoms over at uh, Thames, um, I, yeah, I mean, it just, it was just ever, never ending. I was very busy as a warm up man. And when you were doing, say, stuff like play your cards right, you obviously met the late, great Sir Bruce. What was he like for you? Did, did you admire him as a, an entertainer? I, I admired him a hell of a lot. Um, he, I wouldn't say um, he was the most accommodating for a warm up man because if you went on and got laughs, the first thing you'd hear is, get him off, love, get him off, he, 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 you know, and he would panic. He would, but most comics are like that. So <laughs> I, I understand exactly why why he would have done that. Yeah. <laughs> I love the way. He was, he was lovely, he had his ways. I mean, I, I love the way you're so tactful, Jeff, because you're like me. You, we, if, we, if we said the stories, it'd be like, oh, people would never believe you. But I love that line in your, your notes as well, where um, you... Bumped into this uh, now famous actor. Hey, that was um, Tony Robinson. Oh, was it? Oh, Tony. Yeah, Rob oh. Gordon Cade was lovely. Uh, um, Gordon Cade was in the same sitcom. It was a, yeah. a sitcom called Mrs. B and the Boys. Oh, and yeah. um, it was only a one off. And Thora Heard was in it. And it was by uh, directed by and produced by a guy called Dennis Main Wilson. 
who was a big a big cheese yeah big cheese he I, he discovered tony hancock or something like that yeah anyway um yeah but tony robinson uh was we, we were in this gang and tony and i you know we were, there's a, a few of us in this gang and uh yeah a few years later i'm doing warm-ups at the bbc and i went up to him, i said hey tony how you doing what i said uh jeff stevenson he went sorry i said we did a sitcom mrs b and the boys and he went oh no no he didn't want to know so i just <laughs> went no problem and i walked away yeah, <laughs> yeah. but, but just... he, he did make me laugh because a few years later he was uh, he turned up at my son's school to do that treasure hunt where they dig treasure or whatever. oh yeah and my son said after my son come back, he went, who does this bloke think he is? He's walking around school with a bodyguard. He said, we're a prep school. He said, who's going who's gonna to arm him? I have a lovely Jess Conrad story, and he doesn't mind me telling it. Go on, fire We were going me. uptown. We were going up London one day to do a thing. And uh, he said to me, he phones me up, and he says, uh, Jeffrey, he said, um, he said we've got to go to London. He said, um, can we travel together? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. He said, how, how are you getting there? I said, I'm going on the tube from Hillingdon. And he went... Tube, tube. So I went, yeah, no problem. So he said, oh, okay. He said, uh, I'll meet you outside the station at eleven o'clock. So eleven o'clock, I turn up. He's got the big hat. He's got the big coat. He's got the scarf. He's got the dark glasses. So I said, hey, do it, He said, you're going to have to talk me through this. He said, I haven't been on the tube in years. So I went, all oh, right, okay. So I said, follow me, and we go in, go up to the ticket office, and the ticket office bloke looks up and he says. All right, Jess, third time this week. <laughs> and was he embarrassed about it? It was a wind up. He did a it was a, a complete wind up. I'm sure it was. He couldn't have he couldn't have been serious about it. You never but know. It was very funny. You never know, very Jeff. Funny. You never know. Yeah, yeah. Now a lot of people, of course, will be envious of you because you've been in uh, one of the well, probably one of the biggest sitcoms. Uh, really, of the last 50 years now, when you think it's always voted number one, everybody loves it, only Fools and Horses. How did that come around? Well, when I was 16, I did the Mrs. B and the Boys for Dennis Wayne Wilson. Uh, Dennis liked me because he liked comics. And he said to me, um, I want you to come to the BBC Club uh, after rehearsals. I want you to meet this guy. He's a, 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 a script writer. Uh, he said he's working as a stagehand. He said, but he might be able to write some material for you. I said, oh, great. So anyway, uh, go into the bar and this bloke comes in, sort of very casual, but, you know, uh, and he comes in and it's, it was John Sullivan. Wow. And uh, it, he, he introduced me. So John Sullivan and I got on great. Um, so then uh, John remembered me and um, I got a booking to play a small part in Citizen Smith. Oh, I've I love that. Okay, yeah. that. Six lines. Yeah. Um, that, I've just got to say, though, that today, uh, today, Jeff, is almost back in fashion, isn't it? Because yeah. he was, that was a Thursday night, I think, for me. Uh, I remember that yeah. as a kid. And um, But he was kind of like a militant, wasn't he? Wolfie Smith, I think? Yeah. yeah. Um, in tooting. In tooting front. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems like we've come a full circle now, doesn't it? Because oh, that, that, that would be a topical show today, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah it would be, yeah. 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 No, so I did, I did that, and then... I did loads of warm-ups uh, for him, um, and I warmed up a lot of fours and horses. Uh, then one day, my my agent at the time phoned me and said, I've, I've got a great part for you uh, in Only Fours and Horses. So I said, all right. He said, PC Parker. So I went, oh, great. So I've been working on this. And uh, what he hadn't realised was that uh, about half hour before, Ray Butt, who was the uh, producer, had phoned me and said, Jeff, we've got a part for you. Um, I said, great. I said, would you mind putting it through my agent? Yeah. And so I didn't stay with that agent long because when that agent made out, he'd worked so hard on getting me the part, when really it was me who got the part, I went yeah. back. So um, I, that was it. I played PC Parker into Hull and Back, which was great. Then a few years later, when the show was really big and it was getting big ratings, uh, I was in the bar and Tony Dow, Gareth Gwendolyn and John come up to me and they said, look, we've got a part for you. I said, right. They said... Um, we think it's perfect for you. So I went, what, do you want me to audition and read for it? They said, no, it's perfect. You, I said, what's the part? They said, a bad stag comedian. So I said, well, I said, much as I think that's very nice of you, I said, I'm a bit, you know, a bit insulted. Bit they said, you're doing brilliant. So anyway, uh, I put, and of course it's been, it's been a great, it, I do a few, I used to do a few after dinners, you know, yeah. corporate gigs. 
And uh, the times I've got the after dinner uh, because of my link with Only Fools and Horses. Yes, yeah. And yeah. I mean, when obviously, as you say, you, you were lucky enough to be, you know, be in a couple of times. So did you realise when you were in it what a cult thing it was? And, you know, um, yeah. because you know what I mean, Jeff, you, you're making something and you never know with telly or with film um, whether what makes a classic and what, what is forgotten. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you, you know, you, it's repeated endlessly somewhere in the world, oh. isn't it? You know, you must yeah. be you must be loaded from the royalties, Jeff, I can imagine. Uh, well, <laughs> let, let, let me just say they help out every now and then. I, I'll say to my wife always, the bank's going a little bit dodgy, especially at the moment with all the no work. And uh, she said, oh, look at this. And a, a nice little repeat check's come in. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's good though, isn't it? I'm, and I love the way you touched on um, uh, agents because um, you know everybody I ever interview, whether they be an actor, singer, mm. you know, whatever, uh, agents always get a bad rap. But rightly so, yeah. I think. You know, what I like yeah. about the modern age for you comedians and for anybody really in the entertainment business is people can get you now independently. You know, you can yeah. you can put them to the agent once they've spoken to you. But if you like the idea of a gig, you know, or a film yeah. or play or whatever you can at least think well yeah I'm interested whereas years ago you never probably heard of it did you that's right yeah I mean years ago you would never have been able to find out what's going on you know I mean I every day now I sit there I look at my spotlight page see if there's any castings you know and if there's anything I really think well, that would be right I'd, I'd talk to my agent and say look can you put me forward for this forward for that it's a I mean you know it's a it's show business yeah it's not a, you know it's not a, a, a game yeah it's show business yeah you know? and you yeah. Have, if you Want to push yourself? You've got to, you've got to do it. Is there anybody today, Jeff? That because to me, um, you know, you are a rare breed in comedians. In that, you know, you go out there alone. You just make people laugh. You are a very funny man. And um, what I like about that, when I'm watching comedians like this, I saw something um, a couple of weeks back now uh, on one of the satellite channels called "Comedians Being Funny" or something. And it's just not funny now. You get slaughtered for that when you say, oh, they say you're all footy duty. But what you're doing, standing alone with no script, no nothing, that's an art. A TV comedian is a totally different thing, as I think people, as you touched on earlier on, Tony Hancock, to me, was a TV and radio comedian. He wasn't a stand-up yeah. as such. You yeah. know, he, he yeah. was funny with Galton and Simpson writing it. Yeah, yeah. But to do it off your own, do you write most of your own material then, or do you...? Um, I do now. I, I, I never... When, when I started out, I, I used to write a little bit, but uh, over the years, I've, I've really started to write a lot more. Mm. Um, and I, when I work on the cruise ships, I, I've, I've d developed material over the years of all about the different ports and the different places and... And what have you? So yeah, uh, yeah I, do, I do. I I enjoy the writing. Yeah. I've forgotten what it's like to write them. I had to sit and watch my act the other day and just try and remind myself of what I, I did six months ago because, you know, I haven't really done anything. That's what I mean. It's a blur, isn't it? I mean, as I say, I was reading your CV and you've done so much. But the bits I am interested in and find fascinating, for a comedian like you, you go out and you've opened for big names like Johnny Mathis, uh, Dave yeah. Shirley Bassey, stuff like that. Um, what, how does that differ? Because, you know, they're, they're not a rival for you and you're not a rival yeah. for them. You know, Johnny Mathis, brilliant song interpreter, Dame Shirley Bassey, is there anybody better? Um, so yeah. when you sort of work with them, how does the dynamic change? And are, are they nice to you? What's the memories of those people? Well, uh, yeah, they've always been nice. Um, the fans are different. I mean, I did a... Um, a, a oh, I've got a great Johnny Mathis story. So... Um, my uh, my son was about eight, eight or nine, and we 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 go to um, uh, the O2 yeah. to watch Michael Bublé. Oh wow! So we're sitting there. My son's always been very switched on, and I said to my son, I said, "Do you know what, Harves? His name's Harvey." I said, "Harvey, I said that gig, I said would be me. I could warm up this gig. I could open for Bublé. This is my sort of gig." So he said, "Dad," he said, "You're in your fifties." He went, you've got to get over it. He said, this is not your gig anymore. He said, this is the O2. This is for the likes of Lee Mack, Jimmy Carr, Lee Evans. He said, it's not for you, Dad. He said, so just get over it. So I went, all right. And my wife went, oh, it's going to be trouble now. <laughs> anyway, two days later, I'm doing a gig in London. At the, uh, there's a, 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 a little social club for the government just off of Pall Mall. Well, the... Um, government workers go oh, yeah. and I'm doing a gig there 
I'm walking along and the phone goes. And uh, there was a lovely lady from um, uh, Kennedy Street Management. So she said, hi, Jeff, how are you? I said, yeah, I'm great. <coughs> she said, um, have you, you, you work with Johnny Mathis? So I went, yeah, I said, years ago, in 84, I did a tour with him. Yeah. She said, well, we've just shown him your, um, your, your YouTube uh, link and uh, he'd like you to open for him on his next tour, which is in, in October. So I went, wow, I said, that's fantastic. Where are the gigs? And she went, the O2, the, um, uh, the one in Birmingham, I can't remember that. The Birmingham uh, Arena. Arena. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. The, the, the one in Manchester. So I said, the O2. I said, that's fantastic. I said, yeah, I would love to do it. All I wanted to do was tell my son <laughs> I was doing the O2. Anyway, um, so I went and did it. And my son came with me and wanted to sit in the dressing room. And all that. He couldn't believe <laughs> But his dad was doing the O2. To him, to the kids now, the O2 is what was our Palladium. Yes. It's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, you're right about that. And I think also as well, um, <laughs> it's the way that, I mean, I was, because we'll have to move on because we're out of time. But I want to ask you a couple of quick questions. Who makes you laugh today apart from yourself? You know, because I always find comedians think, that's funny, and they start to chuckle a little bit. Who do you turn to for a laugh yourself, Jeff? Jack Whitehall's dad. <laughs> he, he makes me absolutely scream with laughter. I, I find it, I, I find Jack very funny, yeah. but his dad is just, I mean, that, that series, we love it. I mean, we yeah. sit there and watch it and it's very funny. I like that. Um, I like uh, Rame, Ramesh, um, uh, you know, with the glasses. Oh, yeah. Ra Ramesh, yeah. yeah. I, he makes me laugh. Um, I like, Mac I think McIntyre, Michael McIntyre, is probably one of the best comedians uh, we've had in this country for many, many years. You know, so yeah, I like. I tell you, what I've really got into because I've, I'm doing a TV show on Monday uh, about comedy clips. So I've been watching loads of different comics over the years, and I've been watching Arthur Haynes. Very clever and man. Yeah. I, d I don't know why. I mean, I, I've, I must have been a kid when he was on. Yeah. But he's so funny. Yes. You know, obviously Nicholas Parsons yeah. makes it for him. You know, but yeah. It's, it is funny, isn't it? I always think every generation has one of a kind, you know? So, like, um, one of the people my father loved, um, uh, you know, was a, a comedian called Frank Randall, who was massive yeah, yeah. in Blackpool. But Frank oh, Randall yeah. always, um, to me, you know, Jeff, was like uh, the Bernard Manning of the 50s, if you like. You know what I mean? He, there was that level of, he was quite outrageous, and then they came along in the 60s, and every generation has one, doesn't it? Is there anybody in the yeah. past, other than Arthur Haynes, that you come away and you think, I really like his style. He, even today, he still makes me laugh. Is there, who are those sort of people that set you off laughing? Bob Mancas. A genius. But Bob Mancas. Yeah. I loved Bob. And I, got, I was very, very lucky to know him uh, quite well. Um, I loved, I, I still love Jimmy Tarbert. Yeah. Um, you know, even now, where he doesn't, he doesn't do much stand up now, but when you see him, he still walks on. He's got that class about him. You know, I love all that. Um, and I, I must admit, even though his material, you know, some people get offended by it. Uh, I like J Jim Davidson. Oh, you yeah. Know, Jim was a great... Say what you like about his material, but he's a great comic. You know, he's a great deliverer. Uh, and I also liked Mike Reed. Oh, yes. You know? Do you know, yeah. it was, it's funny, uh, Jeff, I was watching... When we were kids, remember, there was a thing called Run Around on TV. Run Around? Yeah, and I loved that show. I thought it was brilliant. But when it's now been repeated, I can see how he slid in adult jokes, you see. Yeah, yeah. But at the time, yeah. you're like going across your head, and you can obviously see he's not bothered about the kids. He's playing to the gallery that he's thinking, oh, these, yeah. will, these will be funny, you know. Mike was, a, yeah. I was looking enough to me, a very clever man, actually, a very, very slick man. And I do think Jim Davidson gets a bad rap because um, ultimately, he, you know, he's a very clever, uh, articulate yeah, I comedian. I think yeah. because... When you do stuff like maybe you, you support a party politically or whatever, but if you watch him, he's got his own uh, online show. Very clever, yeah. very funny guy. And um, it's yeah. it's a, terrible the way that they, uh, TV channels just dismiss you because they've put you in a box. You know, you're not allowed yeah, to yeah. be on telly. It's quite sad, isn't it? A harder thing for people in comedy. Uh, would you yeah. ever uh, would you ever go on something like BGT or would you think that would be a... Uh, I've don't been mean, asked every year. I was going to say, yeah, every year, yeah. Every year I get the phone call and this, a guy will say, oh, we've got an uh, opportunity for you. It's uh, We're bringing back variety acts and all that. And I, and I go, is it Britain's Got Talent? They go, yeah. I go, no, thanks. 
Um, I've got a friend who's on it tomorrow, um, John Courtney, who's brilliant. Oh, yes. You know, and he, he stands, you know, as much of a chance as anyone of winning it. But I've also seen too many friends of mine thrown under the bus. Yeah. You know, um, the guy last, I think, two years ago, uh, uh, J- Jimmy Twamley. And oh, yeah. uh, he, he's a ventriloquist. And they, they gave him some material. And he did the bit, went to get Simon up. Simon didn't want to know. And it completely killed his act. Oh, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I don't really. It's not for I me. Ask you, um, you know, you. We've gone through this terrible time, right, Jeff? And it's all very messy. Do you see it coming back um, in a different way, or how do you see us reforming? Because I was, I was saying to someone recently that um, when you think about it, we've had all these outside gigs, you know, um, drive-ins and all that sort of stuff. But it also reminds me of how Victorians and Edwardians had their entertainment. When you think about a bandstand on a Sunday with a brass band and folks yeah. sat round, we could end up doing that again, couldn't we? <laughs> I mean, it's all about adapting at the moment. I mean, I, I, I shouldn't be telling you this, but I'm I'm going to work at Lapland UK doing Father Christmas <laughs> for uh, uh, 30 days because it came up, it's a nice, uh, nice little gig. Uh, it was an acting gig. I had to go and audition for it and I got offered it and I thought, Oh, I don't know. It's, that's good money. Yeah. Um, I'll do it. And so I'm I'm doing that in November and December. If you'd have told me a year ago I'd be doing that, yeah. Uh, with all the due, all respect in the world, I would never have, have seen myself doing that. But you have no. to, as you rightly said, I think that's brilliant that you're doing it. Uh, you'll have to be careful not to crack jokes, though, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because kids can yeah. be quite, you know, full on, can't they? You know. But I, no, yeah. I what do you want for Christmas? <laughs> Yeah. I've got the car, not this year. Get out. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, I always, because he always remind you of people like that um, bumbly old Mr. Granger and how you're being served and stuff. They always seem to get people like that. <laughs> and Sandra, yeah. you think, totally wrong person to be doing that interconnection, you know. No, good luck with that, Jeff. I think that's fabulous, actually, that, you know. You, yeah. you, what I like about you is you've obviously adapted and gone to different, you know, strengths in your career and thought, well, I'll try this now, try that. Is there anything that you really would like to do that you haven't done so far that you think, you know what, I wouldn't mind a crack at I'd that. I'd like to do a farce. I would love to do a farce, a good um, farce. Uh, I've, I've always wanted to do that. Um, Bradley is a good friend of mine, Bradley Walsh, and he, he did one a few years ago uh, for Ray Co- Cooney. Yeah. And he said it was a masterclass. He said, because you've got to get everything. It's like um, being a musician. Every line has to have a rhythm and a beat, you know? Yeah. And yeah, no, I would love to do that. Uh, I would love to do a series, a, a, another. I'd love to do another film, if I'm honest. But a, a film, a, a, a big film. You know, our film. I didn't even get paid. It was so low budget. You know, but <laughs> um, hopefully it'll open a few doors. Do you know, Jeff? I, I, honestly, I could talk to you for ages. You, you're an inspiring man, and I've got to say, if anybody hasn't read your stuff online, um, it's brilliant. You started writing your memoirs, which I think should be a book, by the way, uh, and oh, it was you. just so gripping because you were speaking to me about things that I totally understood, you know. And I thought, oh yeah. right, you've gone to this, and then you've had to go that, and all this sort of stuff. And what people don't realise in this world of show business is, and I got blasted for this online when I was doing a report recently that. Um, when the Chancellor was saying, we've all got to retrain and find new ideas, that is show business. It's not a job for life unless you keep reinventing yourself because yeah. doors close and new ones open if you go through them, don't they? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, those notes I wrote, because uh, I was at sea, yeah. um, when COVID started, I got on a ship in Fremantle, Australia, expecting to be on for a week and ended up having to stay five weeks because we couldn't get in anywhere. And we came all the way back to Southampton. So, you know, we had to come up with shows and it was like the old days, you know, yeah, just yeah. coming up with new stuff. <laughs> Sat in a cabin like Charles Dickens every day, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Jeff, listen, thank you so much for talking to me today. I, as I say, it's thank been you very much. an absolute thrill. And uh, for those that haven't discovered you yet, uh, we'll put your website details uh, online. And of course, uh, we'll put the details about the film. And I'm so thrilled that you've become a film star um, all oh. over again, Jeff. All over again. Thank, thank you so you very much. much. <laughs> Take Lovely care. to talk to you. A pleasure. Thanks, bye bye. Bye. <laughs>